Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the next edition of the BioExcel webinar series. My name is Rosan Apostolov, and I will be today's host. As you may already know, BioExcel is the leading European Center of Excellence for Computational Biomolecular Research. And in our webinar series, we feature notable scientists and their work. We also invite developers of popular software applications, uh, various tools that are related to the field of computational biomolecular research. And we also present major achievements and re results of work done in our center, uh, with which we hope that you will find uh, very useful and of interest for your own research work. If uh, you would like to learn more about the center and our activities, you can visit our website at www.pyxl.eu. Today, uh, as a ghost, we have uh, Berg Hess, one of the core developers of Gromax, which you are very familiar with, and uh, he will present us a method that he's been uh, developing uh, the last several years, the accelerated uh, weighted histogram method for accelerated sampling. Uh, Berk is also working in Bioxel, and this is one of the big outcomes of our work. And today, it's my pleasure to present you Berk Hess, who is a professor of theoretical biophysics at uh, KTH, the Royal Institute of Technology in Stockholm, Sweden. And he's been designing algorithms for Gromox for over a couple of decades already. Uh, currently, he's uh, very interested in advanced sampling methods, one of which he's presenting today, and also uh, studying wetting of surfaces at the molecular scale. Okay, welcome to the Bioxel webinar series. Uh, thank you, Rosson, for the, for the introduction. Um, let's see if I can forward the slides. Uh, yes, very good. Okay, so uh, today I'll um, introduce the AWH method. Um, uh, first, say how the method actually works. Um, then how to use it in Gromax, uh, some example applications, and then at the end, as Austin said, we'll, um, there will be time for questions. Um, so the first thing I should say is that most work of this, uh, on this method has been done by my former PhD student, uh, Viveka Lindau, who has uh, developed the method or taken the original weight, accelerated weight histogram method as used in uh, more theoretical physics uh, fields, adapted it for uh, biomolecular simulations and implemented everything, um, added several features and uh, uh, also wrote the, the, the reference manual section as is listed here on this slide, uh, as well as uh, several manuscripts um, using this method. So if you want to read about all the details of the method it's itself, uh, I would like to refer to the reference manual and to the, um, the different um, uh, publications listed here. Okay, but let's start out with with what one the problems one would encounter where one would want to use such an accelerated um, sampling method. So, um, as most of you will probably know, the um, the free energy landscapes of of biomolecules are often well, they are nearly always high dimensional and they're often quite rough. So. Uh, typical situations are is that you might be interested in into different states of the protein, which, for instance, if you're uh, somewhat lucky, you might know the beginning and the end state you're interested in. And then the questions would, could be like, how, what are the paths connecting these two, two states that you're interested in, uh, which could tell you what the mechanisms are, for instance, but also um, if you know the path, you might be able to compute the, the free energy. Uh, profile between these two states and that might tell you how difficult it is to go from one state uh, to another state. One might even be interested in dynamics between these two states which is a bit harder um, but uh, which can also be investigated with uh, somewhat more effort. Um, a more difficult situation might be that you know only know the beginning state and you want to know about a certain unknown uh, other state in the system which is an uh, even harder case. So, because these free energy landscapes are rough and have quite high barriers, it can take a very long time if you just run a normal simulation, as probably many of you will also be aware of. So, uh, if there are ways of accelerating the sampling um, between states, that uh, could potentially give a major speed up of your simulations. Um, 
<clears throat> and thereby you might be able to, to solve problems that you weren't able to solve before or save a lot of computer time. Um, so what is necessary for the method I'll be presenting today, but for many methods that are similar, is that you need some kind of reaction coordinate to uh, investigate the system with. So you need some handle on your system. You usually can't just say, I want to accelerate sampling, period, because then the question is, what do you actually want to accelerate? So there's a few methods that work completely general, like um, increasing the temperature or uh, temperature replica exchange. But then for many biomolecules, they would actually unfold at higher temperatures. So that doesn't help you in figuring out paths between states that you're interested in. <clears throat> so to be able to do something, you need some kind of reaction coordinate, but that will be very system specific. Uh, for, but for most of this talk, uh, I'll assume that you know one or more reaction coordinates. And then the question is, how can one accelerate sampling along such a, a coordinate? So that's what we'll be discussing today. Uh, and in particular, one method used to, to do this. Okay, so um, then general technical challenge in molecular dynamic simulations is that interesting events often happen on timescales on the order of maybe uh, microseconds to, to seconds in biological events or even in, in, in industrial polymers or so, things can, timescales can be even longer. So we might need billions of time steps of, of very short two femtoseconds or maybe a bit more if you use virtual sites in Gromax. Um, so that seems a bit of a, a waste doing billions of steps waiting to see transitions between one state and another. So, but if we actually look at what's happening here, then the event one uh, is interested in or the, the transition itself can often be quite fast. Um, so, there are options there to accelerate things by maybe using smartly using uh, many independent simulations or you could bias simulations to get more events. So if the event itself is fast, then you need to find a way of generating more of those fast events, which means that you could in total simulate shorter potentially. So I'll show you uh, both of these aspects uh, today here. Um, so this could lead to well, it leads obviously to more efficient use of, of computer time if you can spend less time waiting. And it can also lead to shorter time to solution if you're interested in getting a, a, an answer to a question in a certain uh, given amount of, of time if you can run your problem more, more parallel. <clears throat> okay, so uh, this uh, method or generated accelerated me methods, many of those depend on, on the fact that actual transitions can be quite fast. Uh, and you spend a lot of time waiting. So this is also shown in this in this simple, very simplified movie here, which doesn't look at all like a biomolecule or polymer system or whatever, but this is very, very representative of many uh, cases one encounters is that you are stuck in one minimum if the free energy barrier is much higher than the thermal energy KT. So you can wait for a very long time in the starting out in the left barrier and you would never see the right barrier. And unless you can simulate one or many orders of magnitude, uh, orders of magnitude longer. <clears throat> but if you know how this picture looks like, then there's several ways of actually improving the situation. So if you know how it, how it looks like exactly as drawn here, then you could just move your system from the left minimum to the right minimum here, and then you would solve your problem um, of at least sampling the other parts. But that might still not tell you how the barrier how high the barrier is in the middle. So we would like a method that, that samples the whole range you're interested in. So um, if you draw it this way and you have everything, then you could very simply say, uh, I can add a bias potential to my system, which is here the blue potential or negative, which brings down the barrier exactly to zero. So if you could apply such a bias potential, then your free energy landscape uh, becomes completely flat and your particle would move freely from the left to the right. So now you've, of course, modified your, your uh, potential, your landscape, so you'll not be sampling according to the distribution that you would like, might like to have, like the Boltzmann distribution of the original system. But since you know what bias you've applied, you can correct for this. So you can exactly correct your weights of your samples for the bias, which is simply uh, with the Boltzmann factor of the bias potential or minus the bias potential. So that's rather straightforward. <clears throat> so the question then becomes, how do I, for a general system or general reaction coordinate, come up with 
uh, a bias potential that works eff effectively. <clears throat> so um, this is a problem because uh, the bias potential is both the input and the output of the method. So if you would know what the bias potential should look like, so you know the actual free energy profile, the black line here, then you already know your answer, so you won't need to do anything. So in practice, you never know this. So the issue now is that you have um, the bias potential or free energy, which is both the input and the output of the method. So the way to solve such problems where um, some unknown is, is, is both the input and the output is usually an iterative solver. Uh, so there are several solvers for this type of problem available, which you might be familiar, might or might not be familiar with, which is, for instance, metadynamics, uh, adaptive biasing force. Uh, I'll present today the accelerated weight histogram method, and there's uh, many more uh, available in the, in the literature. Okay, so how does the accelerated weight histogram method uh, work? So here, unlike many other uh, methods in this field, the central quantity is the target distribution. So the distribution you would like to have for your system. So you, you set from the start, you set out what distribution do I want along my reaction coordinates or multiple reaction coordinates. And then the method is set up such that you should, uh, if it converges, you should get the target distribution that you have asked for. Uh, so an advantage here of the AWH method is that uh, the target distribution can be chosen completely freely um, and it could even depend but it does not have to depend on the free energy so you could for instance choose a, a flat distribution which is often good not always but a uh, reasonable good choice like i show here in this uh, very simple example um, you could flatten out the landscape and get uh, a freely moving particle on the flat or degree of freedom on the flat distribution uh, on the flat landscape even a flat distribution but one could also um, Sorry, one, one could also choose to have uh, a distribution that, for instance, depends on, on the free energy, which, uh, uh, for instance, certain, certain forms of, of metadynamics have, where you get an, an, exact, an uh, enhanced temperature distribution, so you get a distribution at a higher temperature. Uh, or you could apply cutoffs, as I'll show later. Um, then another nice feature of the, of the accelerated weight histogram method is that the initial convergence is exponential which cannot um, continue forever since, uh, as you probably know, the error in sampling usually goes as the square root of the number of samples. So uh, you can't have any exponential convergence forever. But if the errors are much larger than thermal energy, you can initially have exp ex exponential convergence. And later, as the errors get on the order of the thermal energy, you could you, uh, switch to uh, the, the slower final convergence rate. And this is fully automatically controlled, which is very convenient. And then there's only one uncritical convergence parameter uh, left in the method. Okay, so here's a schematic drawing of what the, what the AWH method does. So uh, you extend the ensemble with uh, a biasing, with an, uh, uh, a coupling parameter lambda, which couples to, which is your reaction coordinate. This could also be multidimensional. So the idea is that you perform uh, or you, you start out with an initial bias, then you, which could be uh, zero if you know nothing, but it could also be uh, some good initial guess. Then you run uh, a similar bias simulation. Then from that you estimate the real distribution because you know what you're sampling, and then you can update the bias for that with the idea of converging towards the target distribution, which of course requires some some physics or some mathematics to work correctly here. So the idea is that we have uh, efficient updates here. And as I said before, the target distribution is explicitly included to converge to. So given this framework, there's actually not many choices to be made because everything has to be consistent according to uh, statistical mechanics. So if one works this out, one gets um, a scheme as drawn here. So one uh, collects samples with a certain uh, bias uh, f0 here for instance starting out and then one needs to generate with these samples a new bias f1 uh, so this these new bias or the correction to the bias from f0 to f1 is given by statistical mechanic which is uh, produces the formula shown at the bottom here so the free energy change in free energy is minus the log of one plus and then one has the fraction of the samples one collected 
So this delta W divided by what you expected given the target distribution. So if that is, um, uh, or uh, uh, the, yes, so that gives you a correction, which is on the order of one over the uh, number of, of, of total samples, which is fully consistent with the statistical mechanics of the recorded, recorded uh, samples. So if you like to read more about this, about the basics, then I suggest you read the reference provided on the, on the, one of the first slides that explains the whole method in detail here. Um, but here, uh, in this um, formula for the free energy correction, there's no choice uh, to make. This is the only uh, way that provides consistent uh, bias to get towards the, the target distribution that you've set. Okay, so if one knows this formula, then it's simply a matter of iterating here um, with uh, collecting samples, correcting the free energy collecting samples. So there are some parameters involved. One can decide how long one wants to sample in between these, um, uh, how long one wants to collect samples, for instance, which we generally do quite often because there's no reason to postpone this. Uh, strictly speaking, one would have to do a complete equilibrium sampling so long enough to get a full flat distribution but in practice that's not really a really a problem <clears throat> okay so um then the next question is how does awh apply the bias that we uh, that we just discussed so the initial setup we had was using a harmonic umbrella potential which is moved using monte carlo mode. so that's uh, somewhat similar to uh, umbrella sampling, but then instead of having many independent simulations with one umbrella in different spots, you move the umbrella around. But the more elegant way, which we've implemented in the actually in the first release, official release of the method in Gromax, is that we uh, have a convolution of Gaussians which are produced by these umbrellas. And we do take uh, the potential of the Boltzmann inversion of this, so to say. So this produces a smooth uh, bias potential over the whole landscape, but still based on. Um, umbrellas at given spots. So we have a regular grid where we have the umbrella potentials which are co co convolved into a, a smooth biasing potential. Uh, this has the advantage uh, compared for instance to metadynamics is that we have um, always a fixed, a fixed grid so we know by, by how far these umbrellas affect each other and we can just index them so we can have a very fine grid or very high force constant correspondingly which requires a fine grid uh, without much extra computational cost, which is uh, convenient. And also it makes the processing very easy if these things are equally spaced <clears throat> and the analysis as well. Okay, so here's an, an, an example of how uh, AWH uh, works here. So this is again, the, the, the simple system with uh, uh, two minima. And you see that the, uh, the, the, the red particle now goes from left to right and it builds up this biasing potential in blue, which starts to over time become very similar to the uh, to the free energy landscape, which is the uh, the black line. <clears throat> and it converges nicely, as you see. So if one would run longer, it, the difference would go to zero. So at the top, there's a correction factor given, uh, or a, a scaling factor, more to say. So that's that's how this, how this uh, initial final state um, uh, conversion is controlled. So this is done by um, having two different stages in the method. So there's an initial stage which has constant update size. So this is not consistent with the formula I, 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 I have shown before, but initially you have very non-equilibrium sampling. So you're pushing the system around uh, forcefully. So in this stage, what happens is that if we cross the whole range, which is easy to say, easy to define in, sing in one dimensional case. Um, and then when, this, when the, range is crossed, which is given by the colored crosses in the plot to the right, then we divide the update size by a factor of three. So this means that, uh, as you see in the plot, that every time we cross the update size goes down by a factor of three. So this gives exponential convergence initially because each time you cross, the update size goes down a lot. Um, then, but this can't continue forever because uh, statistical mechanics tells you that the error in the end should go as the square root of number of samples. So what we do is switch to a final stage where we have constant update weight. So then, as you see in the plot on the right, the update size goes as uh, one over T in that case, uh, which means the error goes down as one over square root number of samples or square root time, one over square root time. Um, and the point where the switch is made 
is exactly when the initial weight would exceed the final weight, which is something you do not want since the initial weight should certainly not be higher than the final weight, since they're um, somewhat biased due to the non-equilibrium pushing of the system. Whereas in the final stage, the system will move around freely. So the system, the method and the system find themselves automatically the right point in time and the right update size to switch from the initial stage to the final stage, which is very convenient uh, because you don't need to control that. <coughs> uh, so that comes out of the, of the method. If one looks at, at how the sample weights then, then change, so on the left there's the update size, on the right is the sample weights, you see that, uh, so there's a log plot, notice that. Um, so the, the, the initial samples are weighted down very, very much. So in the end, if you s stay for, for uh, some time in the final stage, then all the initial non-equilibrium samples will be weighted out completely. One can also explicitly ignore them, but it's not really necessary since they're weighted out exponentially, as seen in the plot on the, on the right. <clears throat> okay, so now we go to some examples of the method here. So one, one um, instructive example is this DNA base pair opening, which, is, which we've studied. So this is an event which uh, happens on the millisecond time scale in experiments, as observed in experiments. So that's too slow to simulate with molecular dynamics, even with Gromax, that's very fast. Uh, closing is 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 uh, four orders of magnitude faster, so that's a, that's reachable in molecular dynamics time scale. So, but from this two rates, one can already see that the uh, the open state is uh, ten to the mind, the ten to the power four less probable than the closed state. So, one in experiment would never observe the open state. So, therefore, simulations are needed to actually. Characterize this and, and see how it looks like and what the process is also involved here. Okay, so what we've done here is we've defined a, a reaction coordinate, which is the, the central uh, hydrogen bonding distance between donor and acceptor in the, in the base pair we're interested in. So on, you see a, a typical closed and open configuration shown on the, on the left. <coughs> this uh, finding the reaction coordinate is actually usually a difficult problem. In this case, it's rather straightforward because it's one. If one knows about DNA, one can think that this hydrogen bond is controlling the process. In many other applications, finding direction for is by far the most difficult problem. But that will not be discussed here. So that's rather method independent, but uh, yeah, finding a good way or finding a good reaction for it. Okay, so then how, does you, how do you do this in practice? So um, the AWH method currently uh, only supports uh, pool, chromic pool coordinates. We plan to extend this in the future to other types of reaction coordinates and more pool coordinates. So uh, one needs to define pool coordinates, which you might be familiar with. So there one needs to define, in this case, two groups, one, one pool between. Uh, the names of those, which are, well, I've just called them res ID here, but actually it's only one nitrogen in each of the residues. That's the two atoms we pull between. And then we set up uh, a reaction coordinate, which is a distance. Uh, and the specific thing here for the AWH method is that now the type is not uh, what might normally be a harmonic potential or something else, but we now provide, we now say we have an external potential provider. And then we have to pr pr provide which provider that is, which is AWH. So that's specified here. So then uh, Gromax will know that the potential for this um, pool coordinate comes from somewhere else and what that is, and that's the AWH method. So now we actually need to provide the now we can look at the parameters for AWH itself. So uh, this is a, the simplest setup one can come up with. So this is, uh, one has to say that one wants AWH, AWH is yes. So now we have one bias with one dimension. Um, we set the coordinate index, so that's the pool coordinate index, which is one. So that ref refers back to the pool coordinate there. So you can link to different pool coordinates. You can also have multiple uh, biases or multiple dimensions which could link to different coordinates. We have to say the interval we want to sample, so it starts in an end range, which in this case is uh, 0.25 nanometers and 0.6 in this file. Then we have to give the force constant for the harmonic potential, which should be, so that's an important parameter, it should be, um, it should give a umbrella potential or biasing potential which is a, can have a higher curvature than your free energy landscape, otherwise you cannot uh, control your sampling. So this should be, in general, you would want this to be high. Um, and as I said before, this is not an issue having this high since 
there's not a strong cost to having a fine grid. The only issue is that you should be able to integrate your system still with the given time step, in this case, two femtoseconds. So this is quite close to the limit of that. Uh, then the error is controlled by the, or the initial update size is controlled by a diffusion and, and, and an initial error setting. So I'll discuss those two parameters later. Those are the, actually control only one parameter in the combination. Um, so that's the information you need to give, which is not much. Then there are a few more things about how often you want output and so on, which I left out of here. Uh, later, we'll also show what happens if we want multiple simulations to, sh to share information that's given by these share options, which are not so many there. You can just say that you want multiple simulation to share a bias. <clears throat> okay, so this is what one has to set up in, in, in practice. Then we can look at what comes uh, out of the method here. Oh, no, sorry, sorry, first we'll, we look at the initial update size. So that's the only uh, parameter that controls convergence. So there are two parameters, but actually we're setting only one quantity here. And that's the initial update size. So, but since the initial update size is not a quantity that's very intuitive, uh, Sure, not to the user, certainly not to the user, but even to me as an experienced person with the method, I wouldn't know what the magnitude of that would need to be. So we set that indirectly by setting um, a diffusion rate, which tells how quickly the system would move along this reaction coordinate, and then some estimate of the initial error. So here's some numbers given, which are quite typical. So initial error of five kilojoules per mole, for instance, and a diffusion of five times 10 to the minus five nanometer per picosecond, a nanometer squared per picosecond, sorry. Um, these are luckily are not, are not very critical. So the, you can vary this initial update size of these parameters by quite a lot, and it will not affect your convergence too much, um, <clears throat> which is a, a very nice, nice property of the method. So um, if one chooses these parameters much too large, so then you get a very small update size, that means you would get, um, slow convergence. So if you make it very, make the uh, parameters um, um, very large, then um, uh, let's see, did I swap this around? Uh, that's correct. Then if you get very slow convergence, then uh, you, you will, will probably notice the system all, almost doesn't move. So. Uh, that's not a desired property. The other things, if they're if they're too small, then the system, the update size gets very large, and then the system might be pulled apart, which is also not something you, that you would want. Um, but that's easy to observe. So I, the, both issues are rather easy to observe, and there's a quite a big region in between where one can choose the parameters uh, uh, and not have too much effect on the conversion speed. This is all because the initial convergence is exponential, and later you go to the one over square t uh, regime. <clears throat> there could still be an issue that your system has slow convergence in general if the motion is slow, so that could be an issue, to, uh, but one can easily figure this out by playing with a few values here, <clears throat> since the initial phase usually goes quite quickly, where you can see what happens. Okay, so then what do you get out of the method? So there's a, a tool called GMX AWH, which extracts from the energy file different quantities. So this is all that's stored in there, um, so you get several quantities out of there. So one is the potential of mean force, the black line in this curve. Um, the, then there's the coordinate bias, which is the, the, the red curve, which is quite similar to the black, but that has the convolution with the bias potential in there. So that means that it's slightly smooth, as you see. So it has slightly less sharp features than the PMF. So that's the bias you, you apply. So the, the, the deconvolution happens automatically and fully consistent with, with the method, and you can get the PMF out right away. Uh, then uh, we'll look, what we'll look into a bit more detail on the next slide is the, is the different distribution. So there's a coordinate distribution, a reference value distribution, and a target reference value distribution. Uh, and then there's also something we call the friction metric that comes out of this, which tells you how difficult it is to move the system over the reaction coordinate, along the reaction coordinate. So this is quite a, a useful quantity, which tells you, in this case, that around 0.4 nanometer, there's some difficult region, which in this case actually is for the DNA opening is where the hydrogen bond breaks and reforms. So before and after, so when it's the hydrogen bond is intact, it's easy to move the system. And when it's open, it's also easy to move. The difficult part is finding the pairing, which is yeah, not so surprising, but actually the method tells you this uh, for this friction metric that that's the high, the difficult part. So in this case, the friction is the high friction because it's difficult to find the pairing uh, of the hydrogen bond. If once the base pair is opened, uh, it needs to find 
the hydrogen bond partner again. Okay, so then we can look in a bit more detail at the distributions that come out. So as I said initially, this AWH method is based on the Starker distribution. So in this case, it's chosen flat. That's the, the, the blue line. So we say we want a flat distribution for the uh, reaction coordinate. And then uh, one can see on the left after 20 nanoseconds that the distribution is quite far off. So we have a coordinate distribution and a reference value distribution, which is, again, they differ by the uh, convoluted uh, or the convolution with the potential. So the, the red line, the reference value is slightly less sharp than the coordinate distribution. So one sees that initially after 20 nanoseconds, it's not the red line doesn't match the blue line very well. So that means you haven't uh, converged the sampling yet. So in this case, the system is managed to, the, the DNA got opened, but it that doesn't go back to close again easily. Likely. So if one simulates longer, like 10 times longer, then things will get a lot flatter. It's still not perfect, but it's a lot better. Um, notice though that the, 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 the free energy is not biased by the same amount that the distribution is biased because that's taken into account. So the answer from after two nanoseconds is quite accurate already, actually, even though the distributions don't perfectly match because that's simply that system spends some, some more time on the one side than on the other. Um, one detail one can see here, one effect is that you see where the arrows are pointing is that the coordinate distribution has a, a, a peak at short distance uh, deviates from the reference distribution. And this is typical of the case where the curvature of the free energy landscape is, is higher than the, than the bias potential you, you provide. So this, would, this tells you if you want this exactly to match or to match closer, you would need to have a, a stronger force constant here, which is getting close to the integration limit. But again, the deconvolution takes this into account, so it doesn't affect the, the results too much in this case, since the, they don't differ uh, by very, very much. So the sampling is still okay. Okay, then we can lo look at, at results one gets. For instance, in this case, you can see that there's, uh, we, we looked at uh, different force fields. You can see for different base pairs and different colors, you can see different free energy profiles. You can also see that the uh, free energy difference is quite high. So the, the sampling is accelerated by several orders of magnitude here. So if you would wait, you would never see the space pair opening. So the method works as it should. Okay, so then um, we can actually also uh, use multiple uh, simulations to sample the free energy landscape. So there's no reason to limit the sampling phase to a single simulation. We can run many. So then the question is how, how many can we run? So we can run the sampling independently for many simulations, they share the same bias. So the, the whole biasing uh, machinery is still only one, but we collect samples from many simulations. So that is an example given here in this movie. So you see that the particles, there's now many. I thought there were 12, but it's difficult to see how many there are. Maybe there are just the six, but they sample much faster. So they move around freely over landscape and converge this potential quickly. Um, so to analyze that, one has to look for each particular case, how well this, this works. So here's a plot given for this DNA example with one, two, four, 16 and 32 walkers. And you see that there's a big gain actually going from one to two from the black to the red line. So that's a factor of four, more than a factor of two. So we actually get super linear scaling here, which is because a single walker gets stuck here and there. Um, so that's unfortunate. So it's actually good to use multiple walkers. You get better effects than using a single one. After that, the scaling is linear up to 16 or so, and 32, it doesn't gain much, much anymore. Um, so with this, we've had a showcase example for, for BioXL, where we had uh, 20 different uh, base pair openings in different sequences, and we could show that we could do it in one hour if we use this ensemble method compared to 34 hours um, without this sharing here to get to an error of half kilo per mole. So this was run on 640 nodes of the CSCS business data machine in Switzerland. So this, this sharing is, is very convenient. Uh, if you have a big system or just one single workstation with a GPU, you can still share. Uh, and that will accelerate sampling quite a lot. Um, then a final example here is uh, aquaporin. So here we uh, looked at how water uh, permeates the channel versus ammonia, which is some bacteria, uh, some bacterial versions of aquaporin allow ammonia to pass as well. And we were interested in why this is the case. So here, this is a, aquaporin is a, a, a multi-merkle system of four uh, identical subunits. So there are four pores, so you can run four independent AWH biases, one in each one. So the method also supports that. 
<clears throat> so then we, we can look at water for which you actually don't need to do any bias sampling because water is just in there so you can just directly look at the distributions. But if you want to look at ammonia, then you need to have some biasing. So in this case, we used AWH because you could use umbrella sampling, but then you actually lock the system in. Uh, so it can't move. If the ammonia can't move, then also residues around it can't move easily. Um, you could also push something through, but then you get non-equilibrium artifacts. So in this case, we could see that um, we get with charm force field at the top and amber at the bottom, we get, for instance, um, ammonia here has a higher barrier to pass through in charm than um, in, yeah, versus water in charm. In amber, it's relatively similar. So there's force fields give the differences here, which makes it difficult to conclude something final here. But you see the method works very nicely in, part in particular, for instance, for you see uh, for charm, you see uh, that the water uh, case, it, uh, um, mutation gives uh, far more structure in the PMF for the water case. So that probably makes water less permeable and makes it relatively easier for ammonia to get through. So the selectivity changes as given by experiment. But you can get very detailed uh, free energy profiles as you see. Okay, then finally, uh, a comparison with, with, with other methods. So here I'll just uh, discuss AWH versus Plume, which is a very popular plugin, of which I've also been in a webinar before, and it's used in, in, in Gromax as well. So AWH is, is very robust and easy to use because there's, it uh, controls itself to a large extent, and there's only one critical parameter, which is not so, so uh, critical to set up. Um, so uh, AWH is limited in the sense that it can currently only act on pool coordinates, unlike Plume, which has a, a much larger range of reaction coordinates. But the advantage is that AWH is fully integrated into Gromax, and therefore the AWH and also the, yeah, as it already did, the center of mass pooling, they work efficiently in parallel. So you can run this on a, on a parallel machine uh, very efficiently with very little overhead. Um, we would also like to extend the pool code with atomic contacts, which is probably one useful extra feature. Uh, and linear combinations of full coordinates, um, or maybe also nonlinear. So suggestions for other extensions are, are, are welcome here. <clears throat> but it's not our goal to cover all the options uh, that, that Plumit uh, provides. So for that, there's, there's Plumit, which does a good, good job of that. But the integration thing brings a lot of performance advantages here, plus the advantage of AWH itself. Okay, so then finally to conclude, um, AWH is a, a very robust accelerated sampling method. So you can see from the since it has a target distribution, if you get the target distribution, things work. If you don't get the target distribution, there's an issue, which might be, uh, you can even see issues with your reaction coordinate. If it's, there's a, a jump in the distribution somewhere, then it means that there's some, some issue in your reaction coordinate at that point. You can also see this from the friction metric. Another advantage is that the target distribution can be chosen freely, so it could be flat, but um, for this multi-dimensional case, ah, there was a slide that disappeared, it was black. That's the multi-dimensional case, which I show here on, on, on the right. So there we, we ran AWH with two different reaction coordinates. So there um, you can get a two-dimensional landscape, but then you would want to cut off, for instance, to, uh, because otherwise if you ask for two-dimensional sampling, you get two-dimensional sampling in a rectangle, which might not be what you want. So you can set a cutoff there, for instance, 20 uh, thermal units, and you get the, the sampling only in the region you're, you're interested in. So there are, many, there are several other choices of, of target distribution as well, which allow you to control the sampling. So there's only one parameter that controls convergence. Um, uh, and this parameter is not very sensitive, um, which is also very nice and it's easy to, to check and control. So we support one, two, three, and four reaction coordinates probably. And I don't think you know, one and two D is manageable, three D probably getting problematic sampling wise. It supports multiple walkers as I've shown, and it works efficiently in parallel. Um, but as a, as a final note, the challenge is still, or maybe now completely, because AWH basically uh, fixes the, the sampling issue once your reaction coordinate is defined. The issue is, is still coming up with a good reaction coordinate. If your reaction coordinate is bad, then any method, uh, no method will work for sampling that well. So the challenge is still coming up with good reaction coordinates. But if you have one, then uh, AWH is a very uh, efficient and convenient method to work with. Okay, so that's um, all for, for my presentation. So now it's time for questions. Thank you, Berk. Uh, can you go to the slide with, uh, which shows how to ask the question? Yes, 
So now we have an uh, opportunity for the audience to speak to Burke. Uh, we have a question by Rajat. So I will try to connect him to audio. Let's see if we can hear each other. Hi, Rajat. Can we hear each other? Yeah, hi, Rosen. Uh, there is a great talk book. You are online, please. Go ahead. Hello, Burke. Yes, yes, I'm here. What's your question? Okay, so I, would, I wanted to know how you define small, large and small quantities for the diffusivity and the energy. Uh, so are there a few orders of magnitude? Um, because I do, uh, let us say we have a reaction coordinate along which I do not have a good estimate for diffusivity. Yes. Uh, how high and how low can we go? Um, well, that's e if you don't know anything, then it's easy. Then you, then you just try some values. So in the end, there's only one only one initial update size, so you just you just vary one of the two parameters and see what you get. Um, so uh, either it falls apart or it goes very slow, and then you can you can you can change you can try try some some values until you get the fastest convergence. So this is this doesn't take much time often because uh, you, you'll see quickly what happens. So if you have no clue, then then you just try. Otherwise, you take the default. I think there's a default value which works quite okay for many cases. But trying a few is not a problem. So it, since since it doesn't affect the final answer, um, you can you, you can do whatever you like and see see if it works. So just play around. Three three different values would usually tell you enough. Thank you, Berg. Uh, uh, Rosen, can I ask another quick question? Uh, yes, please. Uh, so, Burke, what were the pull groups that you used for the aquaporin example? Sorry, what? What were the pull groups that you used for the aquaporin example? Uh, what pull groups? Oh, I have to have to look in the details. So, uh, of course, one uh, one is the ammonium or water, which we also tried. Uh, the other thing is, I, I think it's it's um, most of the pore lining residues. So, I, it's probably the 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 groups closest to the pore. Uh, for a large scale, so you see, you don't want to pull on the outside of the molecule since then it, it might react uh, in in in, uh, in in ways you don't want. So, but it's uh, something that's close. It turned out it, it's usually even that's not too critical in this case because um, the system, uh, unless the initial update size is, is very high, it it won't react too strong. So this might be a problem, of course, in, in other cases. For this case, it's rather uncritical, I'd say. Thank you, Berg. Okay, uh, we have a question by Luca. Let's see, Luca, can we hear each other? Maybe. Uh, yes, I can. I can yes. hear you. Oh, here you are. Yes, go ahead. All right. Uh, so I was wondering if there's a simple way uh, to estimate statistical uncertainties in the Frenergy landscape. Uh, that's a very good question. Uh, I haven't discussed that here in this in this talk. So the more advanced the method is, the more difficult it gets to estimate errors. So one thing is one can look of, of the time evolution, but the the thing we usually tend to do is run uh, a few independent simulations, like four or so, and get the uncertainty from that. Um, so that's the, the the safest way to do. So the the more information the method uses, and AWH uses quite a lot, the more difficult it is to extract reliable error estimates. Um, so I, I I would usually say run independent simulations, which you often want to do anyhow for checking. All right. So one can get a rough a rough guess by looking at at how the free energy changes o over time, but there could be a systematic component into that. Um, uh, we would also look at that usually, but. Uh, for a final error, error estimate for 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 a paper or so, one would want to usually run independent simulations. Thank you. And which you can, by the way, average again. So you can take the error estimate from that, and you can average. If you do four simulations, you can take the average of that to get an even lower error. But then maybe you can also use the multiple walkers for this. No, because those are all coupled. So the coupled case, which I showed, ah. converges much faster, but it's right. even more difficult to get the error from that. So um, mm -hmm. um, I've seen that before, for instance, with, with um, uh, metadynamic simulations with, with multiple walkers. There, people talk about error estimates, but you won't know unless you run multiple of those, multiple copies of the simulations, because they all contribute to the same quantity, so they're not independent. So yes. you can't include any, anything from 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 that. It's the same here with AWH. So 
uh, you get better, you get lower errors, but yeah, you don't know what they are unless you run multiple uh, realizations. Hmm. Okay. Thank you very much. All right, and uh, we have a question by Maria. Maria, can you say something? See we, whether your audio works. Okay, maybe we don't have audio connection with Maria, so I will read her question. And her question is, can the free energy be accurately recovered even in the case of a very high diffusity, the convergence parameter D? Is it critical that this parameter is set in a certain range? No, so that, or well, the answer is yes, it can be accurately um, recovered. So th this parameter doesn't affect the final result, it only affects affects how quick you converge to the final result. So these, these, these two parameters which control the one update size only uh, affect the initial phase. Um, so the, the final result is, is independent of, of the diffusivity parameter you set or of the actual diffusivity of the system. So those don't even need to match. Um, it's nice if they match because then you're, it's easier to understand, but uh, all that doesn't matter. So of course, if your system diffuses very slow, the error is going to be higher since the, the error basically goes with one over the square root of the number of crossings through your interval. So if the system has very low diffusivity, you, you, you need to run much longer, but that's an inherent uh, issue with sampling. So that's not specific to this method. Okay. Uh, thanks, Burke. And uh, we have a question by Arjun. Let's see whether Arjun has working audio. Arjun? Can you hear us? Mm. Probably, yes, but, uh, so Arjun hears us, but we can't hear you. You're unmuted. Probably the microphone is not working. Okay, I will read uh, his question. Would you suggest using this method for large protein with a large open and closed state, given using center of masses? Um, well, that's a difficult problem. So uh, this method works works well in general, but it's it doesn't make the problem um, much easier. So I, I would say yes, it it works, but things can be very slow because you, the, the the system has to diffuse. In the end, this method biases away the free energy barriers and your system will diffuse over the flat energy landscape if you chose flat as a target distribution. So this diffusion is going to be very slow in the case of a, of a protein with two large domains. So it will work, but it will be very, very slow. But having said that, I don't know of any other good methods to, to, to tackle this problem. So I would think it's quite hard unless you have a lot of computational time. But this method won't do any worse than other methods, I'd say. Uh, so it just takes a lot of time. Okay, thanks, Burke. Uh, <clears throat> uh, we don't have other questions in the queue. Uh, I have one question. Would you give any tips, for example, some recommendations about choosing reaction coordinates, which is a, a challenging step in the... Uh, uh, no, so that's, that's, that's very system dependent. So that's, that's the critical question in most cases is what is a good reaction coordinate. But that's, for that you have to know about your system. So if I, people give me a particular system, I could say something, but that's not my, not my job, of course, here to provide uh, people consultants on that. Um, but uh, this, is a, this is a hard problem. So the, 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 I would like to have, well, what I would really like to have is a method that, that, that can automate or help search for better reaction coordinates. But AWH already helps in a certain sense, since as I said during the presentation, you see when the, tar when the distribution does not convert to a target distribution. That's one thing. And the other thing, the metric has been very helpful in, in finding where there are issues in the reaction coordinates. So if you see a high peak in the metric and you don't understand why, like in this DNA case, I, we knew why it's there. It's because you open, it, you open and close or you need a break and reform the hydrogen bond. So, that's natural. So we yeah, might be able to improve the reaction coordinates there. Um, one can actually also, which I haven't presented here, uh, do a nonlinear transformation of the reaction coordinates, which is in one of the papers. So you spend more time at this um, 
it's a difficult region. So that can actually help some. Um, but this, 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 fric this friction metric can often tell you where there's issues in your reaction coordinates. So it might tell you where there's a problem. It doesn't directly tell you how to improve the reaction coordinate, but it has helped us in many cases identify issues with reaction coordinates. So that's at least one thing is that you can see in which particular area there are issues with your reaction coordinates and that might help you to find issues quicker and come up quicker with better reaction coordinates. Thanks, yeah, it is a, a challenging problem. Uh, there is uh, one uh, request from Arjun, just came in, uh, if possible to give a tutorial with an example uh, in future. But what's meant there? I mean, there were examples here, or does, does he mean an, an, an interactive tutorial? Uh, uh, for AWH? We, so we, we, we actually have an, have an AWH tutorial that we use at workshops, at Bioxol workshop, but we haven't published that yet. So I was looking if someone was online, but there wasn't yet. So we should, uh, we should uh, go through, these, through the one or two tutorials that we have and see if we can publish them so people can have a tutorial to, to play around with. Um, on the other hand, the method is quite is quite simple to use. So it's if you want to apply it to your system, it's not hard to do just by using a manual. Okay, great. Well, this uh, this would probably be exactly what Rajon is uh, looking for, and he thanks for it. Uh, okay, uh, it looks like we don't have more questions and. Uh, that is all then, uh, Berg, thank you again for the great presentation. Uh, yeah, thank you for me. To the next slide. Just a heads up for the community that uh, in November we will have a webinar with Steve Crouch from the Software Sustainability Institute in UK. And uh, it's, a, it's a very uh, interesting topic which uh, refers to software development in general uh, how how to build your so software how to maintain it uh, how to work with the communities around it to ensure that in the long term it's uh, a sustainable uh, product it, uh, some of these uh, ideas are heavily influenced Gromus development as well so i would recommend to all of you who develop your own code to attend this uh, webinar and uh, subscribe to our mailing list visit our website uh, we will have uh, more webinars coming we are in discussion with the presenters so keep an eye on on twitter and on the website as well uh, thanks to everybody today and thank you back again and we'll see each other soon bye